<laughs> I feel a little mad about that. Yeah. My heart rate was really down until she said I was going to enlighten and illuminate. <laughs> Pressure right now, but okay. Well, just do whatever you do. I'll do my thing. Yeah, absolutely. So there okay. You. So, um, people of color have been talking about white privilege forever, right? <laughs> but um, it's really only. Uh, I'm going to base this presentation on a couple of kind of uh, seminal articles from the canon of diversity literature. In 1988, Peggy McIntosh, who is a professor um, at, I want to say, Wellesley College in Massachusetts, wrote this article called White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. Um, and it's become sort of a classic article in the literature of diversity studies. So you might have studied this in school, or you might not have never heard of this. But I'm going to use. Uh, Peggy McIntosh's framework to sort of kick all of this off. So, so Peggy McIntosh um, uh, is a female professor working in uh, um, working at a college that was dominated by male professors, um, and she started thinking about her experience as a minority, as a female faculty member at a university. And what she pointed out, uh, or what she realized, was that the men that she worked with were very willing to admit and affirm um, that females are oppressed. They absolutely were down for that. They could come up with all sorts of examples. But she noticed that the flip side of that equation, that males are actually privileged, was something that was much harder to admit. Right? So the guys were all for, yes, women are uh, oppressed, but when it come, came time to sort of look at themselves and say, what were my advantages that I got just for being male, it seemed like a sort of a different story. And she actually used that experience um, to also begin to think about the privilege, the unearned privilege that she wrote that, that uh, is conferred to her as being uh, white. So she wrote this article about white privilege. So we should start out by uh, trying to define what, what white privilege is. Um, McIntosh says that it is an unearned advantage. In other words, you don't have to do anything to get it, except my father would say an accident of birth. Um, <laughs> just being born white, you're already ahead of the game. Um, it is a conferred dominance. One's status as a Caucasian already comes uh, with a, a status of domination, and that has to do with centuries of history, right? So white privilege is systemic. By that I mean it is woven into um, society, culture, institutions, um, but it rears its head interpersonally. So it's a systemic issue, like a wide lens issue, but it plays out on a couple of different levels. It can play out interpersonally between two people, um, you know, socially with groups of people, and uh, even within institutions. White privilege, we'll talk about other kinds of privilege tonight as well, but I really want to focus on uh, white privilege. Um, is insidious because it flies under the radar, because it appears to be, I should say, at least for white people, business as usual. It's just the way the world operates. And when you're in that group, um, uh, it can be hard to recognize that it's a thing, as the young people would say. So it's often difficult to see if you're a member of a privileged group um, when it is pointed out, usually by members of marginalized or unprivileged groups, um, it's frequently dismissed as a chip on someone's shoulder, right? So if you are the African-American female who dares to bring up white privilege, um, you're an angry black woman now, right? Oh, oh my gosh, audience participation. I like that. 
Yeah. And this experience is very insidious because it takes enough uh, guts and fortitude to point this out in a culture of, you know, of white domination. But then furthermore, to have your experience dismissed or negated is kind of like another blow. So Peggy McIntosh, McIntosh began to contemplate um, the ways that she has uh, been bestowed this unearned skin privilege, but has been conditioned into oblivion about. So she talks about obliviousness. That is, members of dominant groups are oblivious that this is actually a thing. That's the business as usual aspect of this. Um, when I'm trying to put my lectures together at UWF and I'm procrastinating, I'm really into looking for clip art. So. <laughs> but right here on the left, you may have heard, of, you certainly have heard of the case of Casey Anthony. I say every bizarre crime that happens, happens in the state of Florida. But maybe you did not hear about the case of Kelly Williams Bowler. Um, from Ohio, and Kelly Williams Bowler was convicted as a felon and put in jail for um, lying about the school district that she lived in so that her two girls could get in a better school. Oh, wow. um, Kelly Williams Bowler, uh, her father lived in that particular school district, so she registered her kids um, as belonging to that uh, school district that was exposed, I don't remember how, and she was actually charged and convicted as a felon and actually jailed for this. Um, and there was such a public outcry that the governor of Ohio pardoned her to get her out of jail. So how does Casey Anthony lie about details related to her dead child um, and be found not guilty, and Kelly Williams Bowler be put into jail um, for misrepresenting what, uh, what school district her kids are in. Um, this is not your bad eyesight. This is just, it's been too enlarged for you to read, but the, the television is saying this just in, police have released the description of an alleged gunman who's been terrorizing the downtown area. The African-American guy saying, please don't let it be a black guy. <laughs> the Middle Eastern guy saying, please don't let it be a Middle Eastern guy. And the white guy saying, ha, they'll never catch me. So, <laughs> thank you. The power of white privilege. So, of course, uh, white privilege shows up in our criminal justice system. That can be a whole, well, you all have been talking about that a lot. What Peggy McIntosh did in this article, which was at the time thought to be sort of so innovative, is she came up with a list of privileges that are afforded to her as a white person that most of the time, most white folks would never really have Considered. So I want to uh, mention just a few of these. She says, I can go shopping alone and be pretty sure that I will not be followed around or harassed. Yeah. Um, I found this clip art, which was this <laughs> young man who uh, sort of photographed and recounted his walk around this store and how the cashier employee kept appearing no matter what section he was in. So this is a whole series of selfies that this uh, young man took. Um, number seven, I can be sure that my children will be given curriculum materials that testify to the existence of their race. Um, teaching at UWF, UWF is a pretty diverse school. The military has brought a lot of diverse people to Pensacola and um, I noticed a couple of years ago, since I'm the clip art guy for my PowerPoints, that um, almost any term that you put into Google Images, a seemingly neutral term. So uh, mothers with babies, put in mother with baby into Google Image and see how far you have to scroll down 
before there's anything other than a white woman with a white baby. Um, kind of an example of how uh, we are flooded with these images that people end up internalizing, right? Like, is it a coincidence that you have to scroll down this far before you see an African-American mother and a baby? Like, um, I would say no, it's not. So, Now, Peggy McIntosh wrote this article in 1988. And um, lest you say, ah, it's an old article that doesn't happen anymore since 1988, yes. go to your Google Images tonight. Um, I can swear, wear secondhand clothes, or not answer letters without people attributing this to the bad morals, poverty, or illiteracy of my race. This is what uh, sociologists call the fundamental error of attribution, um, where people make a large judgment based on um, a single experience. Uh, whatever, this happened with my interaction with an African-American, therefore all African-Americans do this. Rarely is that, I'm not going to say rarely, I should say never when white people have a bad experience with a white cashier, do they walk out of the store going, damn white people. <laughs> right? This reminds me of my mother who says, a very nice black plumber came to fix our pipes. Um, she would not say, a very nice white plumber came to fix our, right? It doesn't, uh, because a very nice white plumber, that's business as usual. Why would we expect a white plumber would be anything other than really nice? She also, I talk about my family a lot when I teach. She also said, um, did you know your niece is dating an Afro-American? She always drops her voice <laughs> to a whisper when she is talking about any, like, I think he's Jewish. Is that <laughs> things? So the Afro-American boyfriend and I said to her, oh my gosh, are we in 1970? Like, that was three or four terms ago. <laughs> what can I tell you? Oh, OK. So, um, yeah, just pointing out, you know, go to your local bookstore, look at the greeting cards, uh, the dolls at Toys R Us, the literature for children, and again, you're going to have to look a little bit harder to see anything that doesn't describe the white experience. Um, I can choose blemish cover, cover up, or bandages in flesh color and have them more or less match my skin. Um, white people, it never occurs to them that Band-Aids uh, are going, right? This is the one that most of my students usually go, wow, I never thought about this. Um, a student talked to me about uh, an African-American student who said, I was just looking for nude pumps, like nude, not nude, no clothes on, but right? Anything that's described as nude shoes, they're nude white shoes, right? Okay. Ah, all right. So, Peggy McIntosh, again, she says the pressure to avoid thinking about this as a white person is great because once you start thinking about it, um, it means that you have to give up this myth, this American myth called meritocracy. So what's a meritocracy, <laughs> UWF students? <laughs> what does the meritocracy mean? You've got to earn it. Well, I have it. It, yes, it actually means you get ahead due to merit, right? So, and it's a great American value. Like, if you work hard enough, right? This has been drummed into us forever. Peggy McIntosh says the pressure to avoid thinking about white privilege is great because once I start thinking about it and acknowledge it, then I have to give up this idea that I got where I am because I'm smarter, I work harder, right? Instead of that I already started 50 paces ahead just because of what I look like. Furthermore, to sort of 
you know, shake her foundations and all of our foundations here. If these things are true, if white privilege exists, and if it's not a meritocracy, then maybe we're not such a free country after all. Maybe this idea that uh, if you work hard enough, you're going to get ahead, you know, suddenly we're blowing holes in this. Um, many doors open for certain people through no virtues of their own. So I got further ahead, not because I'm smart and fabulous and all those things, um, which I am, by the way, but <laughs> I started way ahead. The doors were open for me just for this random skin advantage that she talks about. This says, use your white privilege, Luke. That's for the Star Wars. <laughs> That's for the Star Wars things. <laughs> okay. Um, Peggy McIntosh also talks about, um, we hear it a lot, I'm not a racist, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not a racist because, fill in the blank, because my hairdresser's husband's cousin married someone who's African American, so I'm not racist. So she says she did not see herself as a racist because the um, the definition of racism that she was operating from was the N-word spray painted on the side of a car, um, was spitting at people and attacking people. Oh my gosh, I would never do that, so I'm not a racist. Um, she never thought about, it's kind of like the example I gave at the beginning, how we said that uh, so many men were willing to admit that sexism is a thing, but not so willing to look at the fact of the flip side of privilege. So um, she says, as long as we construct racism as being this, then we're really off the hook, because none of us ever did that sort of awful thing. But um, in some ways, we put our blinders on when it comes to the invisible business as usual system.